My thanks to our convener, Professor Marie-Claire cordonnier Seger, to the many university institutions that have worked together to make this event possible, and to those colleagues poised to respond to tonight's lecture. We held the first of these lectures almost exactly three years ago in 2019, when Lord Nicholas Stern spoke to us about sustainability and, international, and internationalism. To say that a lot has happened since then might be the understatement of the decade, even century. We're reaching the second anniversary of that date, the 11th of March, 2020, when the Director General of the WHO declared, and I quote, we have made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic, end quote. Since then, we've certainly learned much about globalization, its obvious advantages, and some of its equally obvious dangers. We've been forced to ask ourselves questions about what it means to live sustainably and healthily on this planet. We've certainly rediscovered the power of ideas, especially when ideas are turned into concrete action, but we also understood their limits. It's perhaps a sign of the privilege that comes from living in a developed country that the COVID-19 pandemic was, for so many, such a rude awakening, requiring us to reevaluate much of what we took for granted. The past two years of battling COVID have led in many instances to a paradigm shift, a process of adjusting to the unimaginable. Just like in other ways, this past week also appears to have heralded a process of adjusting to the unimaginable. But what we in the UK experienced with a sense of shock and disbelief may have been less surprising to our distinguished guest lecturer, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Gabriesus, elected as Director General of the World Health Organization in 2017. Dr. Tedros served as Ethiopia's Minister of Health from 2005 to 2012, leading a comprehensive reform of the country's health system, expanding universal health coverage and the provision of health services. As Ethiopia's Minister of Foreign Affairs from 2012 to 2016, he made health a political issue nationally, regionally, and globally. Prior to his election as Director General of the WHO, Dr. Tedros held many leadership positions in global health, including as Chair of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, tuberculosis and Malaria, as Chair of the Roll Back Malaria Partnership, and Co-Chair of the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health Board. No one could have been busier over the past two years than Dr. Tedros. As Director General of the organization charged with managing the response to COVID-19, he was not only raising the alarm and leading the charge to control and eradicate the disease, but trying to get nations to work together to reduce some of the glaring public health inequalities that the pandemic revealed and exacerbated. The pandemic is not over, and the WHO's response efforts continue. Dr. Tedros's push for collaboration remains a clarion call to global action and global solidarity. But perhaps there are some lessons that have already been learned at the WHO and which will prepare us to better face future health crises like the one we've lived through and continue to live through. Tonight, I very much look forward to hearing from Dr. Tedros what some of those lessons might be. I can't think of a better time for this lecture to be taking place or of a better guest to be delivering the lecture. Dr. Tedros, on behalf of our Cambridge community and on behalf of those watching from around the world, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you and to express our enormous gratitude for your service and your continuing effort on behalf of us all. I'll now pass back to Marie Claire, our host for the evening. Thank you, Professor Toop, for your opening remarks and for your leadership and vision in this lecture series on globalization, sustainability, and the power of ideas. I would now like to introduce our chair for this evening's event, Professor Marie-Claire Cordonier-Sego. 
Professor Marie Claire Cordonier Seger is Leverhulme Trust Visiting Professor in the University of Cambridge with the Bennett Institute for Public Policy, the Center for Environment, Energy and Natural Resources Governance, the Lauterpacht Center for International Law and other partners. She also serves as Senior Director of the Center for International Sustainable Development Law and a full Professor of Law at the University of Waterloo in Canada. She has published 22 books and over 140 papers on globalization, sustainability, and the law in six languages. Served as senior legal counsel and expert for the United Nations and other treaty bodies, and is laureate of the Justitia Fundamentum Regnorum and the Wiedemantri International Justice Awards, among other distinctions. I hand it now to the chair for this evening. Thank you very much to our moderators and also to Professor Stephen Toop who has established this lecture series and shepherded it to its current shape and form. This special lecture event provides a crucial opportunity to consider how the current COVID-19 pandemic is affecting efforts to advance the world's sustainable development goals, especially SDG 3, good health and well-being, but also SDG 1 to end poverty and many others. The pandemic has exacerbated existing inequalities in health, education and childcare, employment, access to safeguards and to justice, among others. It has created new inequalities in access to ventilators, protective equipment, medical knowledge and vaccines. Human impacts are still occurring with successive waves of different variants risking global economic contractions, over 5.2% according to UNDP's most recent estimates, undermining efforts to secure sustainability and driving millions more into poverty, peril, and potentially also conflict. In most of our world at present, the COVID-19 pandemic is nowhere close to over. And for the future, global gaps in preparedness have been shown, thrown into sharp relief. In our current era of globalization and common challenges, ideas are more powerful than ever. As we struggle to rally, respond, and recover, we are deeply grateful to be joined by Dr. Tedros Aranom Gebreyesos to share a unique, truly global vision of both what we must learn and also how to move forward together. Professor Toop has already introduced our distinguished lecturer for tonight. I will simply note that we are deeply honored by his kind willingness to join us to deliver the University of Cambridge 2022 Vice Chancellor's Lecture on Globalization, Sustainability and the Power of Ideas. Indeed, for Sustainable Development Goal 3, there is perhaps no one better placed in the entire world to do so. Dr. Tedros, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Cordonier Seger, for that very kind introduction. And also thank you, Professor Toop, uh, for your welcome and very kind introduction. And to all students and faculty who have joined us uh, today to Tejas Rao, Charlotte Milbank, and Nebo Rome, uh, who are moderating, I think, this session. And it's a great honor for me to be with you, albeit virtually. And I'm associated with um, the University of Cambridge. I used to visit my friends there and attended some meetings, uh, but bigger association with the UK because I did my master's in the University of London, London School of Hygiene and my PhD in the University of Nottingham. So by association, actually, I'm also close to uh, Cambridge. Uh, so thank you for everything that you're, you're doing. I have always been proud of uh, the University of uh, Cambridge, and uh, this is really a great honor for me uh, to uh, give a lecture. Uh, so, uh, you know, thank you for your kind words, but the uh, honor and pleasure is, is, is mine. And of course, this is a virtual meeting and look forward to uh, visiting your, your campus once more and, 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 and pay respect. Uh, let me start by talking about a pandemic, but not COVID. It's the deadliest pandemic in recorded history, the Black Death which killed an estimated one third of the population of Europe, including up to 60% of the population of Cambridge. 
The terrible toll of the Black Death was in part because no one knew exactly what caused it, how it spread, how to prevent it, or how to treat it. It wasn't until hundreds of years later in 1894 that Alexander Yersin identified the bacterium that caused bubonic plague. By contrast, the novel coronavirus that causes COVID-19 was identified and sequenced within just two weeks of the first reported cases. Science has given us tools to fight this virus our ancestors could not even have dreamed of, the ability to track its evolution almost in real time, to test for it rapidly, to treat it, and of course, to prevent it with safe and effective vaccines. But the global failure to distribute those tools equitably has prolonged the pandemic, as we all know. And so here we are more than two years into the pandemic and the world remains in its grip. It may not feel like that in Cambridge, and it's certainly pleasing to see that reported cases and deaths are declining in the UK and life is returning to some semblance of normality. But the global reality is that this pandemic is far from over. Since the beginning of this year, more than 60,000 people a week have died on average. That's about the population of Cambridge every two weeks. And of course, the threat remains a new of a new variant emerging that's more transmissible, more virulent, and less susceptible to vaccines. We might be done with COVID-19, but it's not done with us. The effects of the pandemic go far beyond the death and disease caused by the virus itself. Health systems have been severely disrupted with millions of people missing out on essential services. As you know, only too well, education has been disrupted for millions of students, especially those for whom online learning is not an option. Millions of people have lost their jobs or been plunged into poverty. The global economy is still clawing its way out of recession. Political divisions have deepened nationally and globally. Science has been undermined and inequalities have widened. COVID-19 is a brutal demonstration that a pandemic is so much more than a health crisis. And I'm glad Professor Tup called it a rude awakening. It touches every area of life, economics, education, families, employment, business, technology, trend, travel, tourism, politics, security, you name it, so much more. When health is at risk, everything is at risk. As we look to the future, I would like to suggest five areas in which I believe we need substantial change to make the world, if not pandemic proof, at least more pandemic resilient. First, we need a realization globally, nationally, and locally that health is central to sustainable development. For far too long, health has been compartmentalized and deprioritized nationally and internationally. In too many countries, health has been as a cost seen as a cost to be contained rather than an investment to be nurtured, an investment in social and economic development and sustainability. History teaches us that health is not an outcome of development, it's the means. Both the UK and Japan, for example, began their journeys toward this universal health coverage in the aftermath of the Second World War. Not when they were economically strong, but when both countries had been impoverished by war. And in both cases, 
universal health coverage has been one of the foundations for the decades of stability and prosperity that have followed. Importantly, it's not just the size of the investment that matters, it's where the investment is made, which leads me to my second shift, a greater emphasis on public health. In recent years, many high-income countries have invested heavily in advanced medical care, but many have neglected investments in public health. As a result, they were overwhelmed when the pandemic struck. For example, contact tracing is one of the most simple but effective public health tools for responding to outbreaks. Through their experience with previous outbreaks of infectious diseases, many lower income countries have developed strong infrastructure and muscle memory for contact tracing, which has helped them respond well in this pandemic. Probably the Mekong region as a block has done very well compared to the rest of the world. The bedrock of public health is strong primary health care, which is the eyes and ears of every health system, helping to detect and respond to outbreaks at their earliest stages at the community level. Primary health care is also essential for promoting health and preventing disease. I do not mean to downplay the importance of secondary and tertiary care, which are vital too, but a strong primary health care system can help to prevent or delay the need for secondary or tertiary care, leading to better health outcomes for people and lower costs for health systems. Essential to this effort is a well-paid, well-supplied, and well-trained health workforce. Another vital element in a strong health system is access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable essential medicines and vaccines, which brings me to the third shift, local production. While the pandemic has posed a global threat, the manufacturing capacity for the tools to stop it have been concentrated in the hands of a few, mostly high-income countries. This was the case with personal protective equipment in the early days of the pandemic and is also the case with vaccines. Vaccine nationalism, export bans, and bilateral deals between manufacturers and high-income nations effectively excluded COVAX and the countries that were relying on it from the global vaccine marketplace. These are mainly countries with low, uh, which are low and middle income countries. Even before the pandemic, expanding local production of medicines and vaccines was a priority for WHO. The pandemic has made that need even more acute. That's why WHO has established a technology transfer hub for mRNA vaccines in South Africa as a public-private partnership. Already the hub has developed its own vaccine candidate and certain countries have been approved to receive technology from the hub. Increasing local production is essential not only for strengthening health security, but also offers huge economic benefits. This lack of global solidarity in sharing vaccines and other tools has been symptomatic of a broader deficiency in the global response, which leads me to the fourth shift, the need for significant change in the global health architecture for pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. Briefly, WHO believes change is needed in three areas. First, we need stronger governments. In the face of a common threat, the world needs a common approach with common rules of the game that govern the global response. Instead, the pandemic has been marked by a patchwork of different and sometimes contradictory responses, which have led to confusion, division, inequity, and stigmatization. However, 
there is encouraging progress in this area. At a special session of the World Health Assembly last year, WHO's 194 member states decided to negotiate a new international instrument to provide an overarching framework for pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. An intergovernmental negotiating body for this new instrument or INB held its first meeting here at WHO headquarters in Geneva last week. Second, we need stronger financing. It's obvious that nationally and globally, we need substantial resources for strengthening global health security. Our analysis estimates the needs at 31 billion US dollars per year. To close the gap for the most essential functions, such as surveillance, research, and market shaping for countermeasures, we support the idea of a new dedicated financing facility anchored in and directed by WHO's constitutional mandate, inclusive governance and technical expertise. And third, we need stronger systems and tools. Already, WHO has taken steps to build some of these new tools to strengthen surveillance. We have established the WHO Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence in Berlin. And that's collective intelligence, which will be needed to detect cases as early as possible. And to facilitate greater sharing of pathogens and clinical samples, we're piloting the WHO Biohub system based at a secure facility in Switzerland. And to improve mutual accountability, solidarity, and cooperation between countries, we're piloting the Universal Health and Preparedness Review. And finally, the fifth shift is the need to move from a siloed view of human health to a one health approach that acknowledges and addresses the intimate links between the health of humans, animals, and the planet that sustains all life. About 75% of emerging infectious diseases inter human populations from animal populations. At the same time, human activities, including deforestation and intensive agriculture that encroach on wildlife habitats can create opportunities for contact with previously unknown pathogens. Unplanned and rapid urbanization can also exacerbate social disparities and inequities in accessing health services and expose people to environmental risks. And of course, many of these same activities also contribute to climate change. In other words, the same unsustainable choices that are killing our planet are killing people. We can only safeguard human health if we also safeguard the health of the planet on which we depend. So to summarize, these are the five shifts I believe the world must make, from seeing health as a cost to health as an investment, from health systems focused on purely treating diseases to systems focused on preventing diseases and promoting health, from concentrated production to local production for equity, from a fragmented global architecture to a cohesive architecture with stronger governance, financing, and tools. And from a siloed approach to human health to a one health approach. And let me finish with the words of Dr. Z. Seming. Sher Sir Ming, I think. His name may be unfamiliar to you. But Dr. Sir Ming was a Cambridge alumnus, a Chinese diplomat, and one of the founders of the World Health Organization. He reported to have said, of course, we can learn from history. 
we learn from the mistakes made, if not from the successes. Learning the reasons why certain things happened often saves us from making the same mistakes again, end of quote. It seems so simple and obvious, but unfortunately, the history of epidemics and pandemics is one of panic and neglect. As a global community, we rush to respond to a crisis, and when it's over, we forget its lessons and do nothing to prevent history repeating. The COVID-19 pandemic is teaching us all many painful lessons. Maybe as professor said it, a root awakening, I like that phrase. My hope is that together we will learn them, that we will make the changes that must be made for a healthier, safer, fairer, and more sustainable future. I thank you and back to you. Dr. Tedros, thank you so much for your remarks. And thank you for being both inspiring and extremely challenging to us all with the five shifts that are need and the appeal to everyone here online who has joined us, as well as everyone who is working on these issues and watching from the live streams to do our best to not just learn from these mistakes, but also improve in the future. Online with us tonight, we have three absolutely brilliant guests who are respondents from the University of Cambridge community that have kindly agreed to give just a few words of ideas in their areas of specialization. Dame Barbara Stalking is currently the chair of the panel for Global Health Convention. Previously, she was appointed chair of the independent panel of experts to assess WHO's out response in the Ebola outbreak. And she also, of course, served as chief executive of Oxfam from May 2001 to February 2013. She was president of Murray Edwards College here in Cambridge until 2021. And previously, she also had an incredibly rich experience in the top management team of the UK's National Health Service, working on many different levels to modernize the health service. Joining her is Professor Sharon Peacock, CBE, who is Professor of Public Health and Microbiology in our university's Department of Medicine, as well as Executive Director of COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium. She's also a non-executive director on the board of the Cambridge University Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. She's published over 500 peer-reviewed papers and trained numerous scientists in the UK and elsewhere. As a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, the Royal College of Pathologists, the Academy of Med Medical Sciences, and the American Academy of Microbiology, as well as an elected member of the European Molecular Biology Organization, she not only holds a CBE for her services to medical microbiology and won the Unilever Caldworth Prize for outstanding contribution, but she was also recently, in 2021, awarded the MRC Millennium Medal. And also, last but certainly not least, we are joined by Professor Bhaskar Vera, who is a professor of political economy and head of the Department of Geography here in the University of Cambridge, as well as a fellow and tutor of Fifth William College and very, very well known to all of us working on sustainability here in the University of Cambridge and in the city of Cambridge. He's founding director of the University of Cambridge Conservation Research Institute for years and a trustee of the World Conservation Monitoring Center. In 2018, he was honored with the Royal Geographical Society's Busk Medal and in 2021, elected as a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences. I can't think of three more learned and helpful international experts from our university to offer brief three minute responses to that inspiring lecture and also, of course, to assist us, especially in learning very important lessons. Please, Dame Barbara Stocking, the floor is yours first. Thank you, uh, Marie Claire. And um, thank you to everyone else out there listening. And a thank you most of all to Dr. Tedros and all the team at WHO for all they've done to work to try to keep us safe in the last two years. Now, I think we're beginning to understand why we need a treaty. 
there were so many issues where we failed with COVID-19 and we really need to be better prepared for the next uh, infectious disease. We cannot stop outbreaks at the moment, but we can stop outbreaks becoming pandemics. And we certainly can also handle pandemics uh, better if they arise. We understand, as Dr. Tedros has said as well, that um, we, we will have future outbreaks from corona, coronaviruses or other viruses on animal to human transmission. And it would be um, really irresponsible of us as good citizens, but also as governments, if we don't, if we let this all happen again, when we know so much about what we need to do. So what are the key principles for the treaty? There are really three, solidarity, equity and accountability. Now, they're all lovely concepts, but how do you make these happen in a real world? And we are very aware of what the real world is like. Um, if I start with um, solidarity, we know that we are all in this together quite clearly. Uh, what one country does affects all others. But we do have issues because countries regard health as a sovereign issue and they're very concerned um, that they should be persuaded to do anything different from what they, they themselves think is right or not do something and yet that those things may be better for their people for their populations now and certainly for the future so we need governments to accept the guidance of who as a standard setting body and to give it much more authority equity is also essential as we know for global public goods particularly uh, where we need to move on intellectual property rights the use of the trips waiver and technology transfer but equity isn't just about the pub global public goods. It's about all countries being able to have the public health systems and in fact the healthcare systems, which we really need in handling outbreaks and, and a pandemic. If this is all going to work, we will need financing for preparedness and response for the low and lower middle income countries. If we don't have that, then actually the, the, any treaty that we set up is simply not going to work. If the money's not there for them and for the, the global bodies, including many you know, around the vaccines and so on, then um, we're really not going to have a success with this. But the most difficult issue is accountability. Governments have to know that if they make difficult position, uh, um, decisions for their own population, that other countries are going to do the right thing as well. Now, what is it that, that we need compliance about? Well, it's certainly the preparedness, which we were failed significantly in. It's about transparency of all the data. Um, uh, but as Dr. Tedros mentioned, it's also about good public health mechanisms, the, trace, the tracing and the, and the isolation, um, but, but also actually the, the will to work, the will to get on with it when we know a treaty is there, when it works, sorry, when we know a pandemic is there. But how do we provide that assurance? My panel believes that we believe that we need within the treaty structure a body, preferably at arm's length from WHO, to have a monitoring function. We say beyond WHO, but not, not to put down WHO in the way, WHO has to be the standard setter, but it's quite hard to be the friend and supporter of countries and to be their formal monitor as well. So we, we're looking forward to the new INB body, um, to move on things now and to take forward all these issues um, with us, I hope, all backing around it to make it happen. So thank you very much again, Dr. Tedros. Thank you. And we will definitely be coming back to you in the discussion, Dame Barbara Stalking. Professor Sharon Peacock. Well, thank you. And, and I'd also like to really echo my, my deep gratitude and thanks to Dr. Tedros and also to the entire WHO team. Um, I'd like to start really by highlighting and reiterating the glaring inequalities um, and lack of global solid solidarity referred to by Dr. Tedros in the distribution as, of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics. Based on information provided by our world in data this morning, more than 10 billion SARS-CoV-2 vaccine doses have been administered globally and around 23 million doses are given every day. So this really is an unprecedented response to an infectious challenge in a time scale that really is truly remarkable. Around 63% of the entire world population has received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. 
but only 12.6% of people in low-income countries have received at least one dose. Considering Africa, whilst noting heterogeneity in vaccine coverage by country, only 10% of people living in Africa have been vaccinated. This is against a WHO target of 70% by the middle of 2022. Now, the prospect of a largely unvaccinated region is bad news for everyone. It's unfair and unethical for those people who are not offered vaccines, both for their own health, and, but also the health of the people around them. It also works against global pandemic control. An important driver for the emergence of viral mutations, some of which could lead to the next variant of concern, is the sheer number of infections that occur worldwide. Control of infection is an important intervention to reduce the risk of new variants emerging. Uncontrolled infection can't be taken any less serious, seriously now that Omicron is the predominant variant across the world. We know that this causes less severe disease compared with previous variants. And furthermore, some people have referred to the pand pandemic as largely being over. But the emergence of another variant is likely. It's not possible to predict the biological characteristics of the next variant and whether it will cause more or less serious disease than Omicron. But to replace Omicron, a new variant would need to be able to outcompete Omicron, either by being more transmissible or more able to evade the immune response or both. So it remains an imperative that we continue to work towards global vaccination coverage. Key factors are vaccine supply, the provision of vaccines to countries with long expiry dates and overcoming logistical issues as well as vaccine hesitancy. I'd also like to reiterate the importance of the fundamental weaknesses in the global architecture for pandemic preparedness and response that we've been exposed, that have been exposed and exacerbated by the pandemic. For many countries, we've witnessed insufficient supplies of essential equipment, including PPE, oxygen and ventilators. Systems were not in place to rapidly scale up diagnostic test manufacture and distribution worldwide. Systems for population-wide contact tracing and surveillance had to be built from scratch in many countries. So this will require a change in global planning, governance and finance, which we've heard a little bit about today from Dr Tedros. I very much support calls for the WHO to be further empowered and sustainably financed. Core funding is important as the WHO increases its capabilities, but flexible funding arrangements are also important as this allows the WHO to be agile and strategic. So to close, we need to strengthen our global governance, surveillance and work together to respond as a global community so that next time a pandemic emerges into our world, we'll be better prepared. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sharon Peacock. Professor Bhaskar Vera. Thank you very much. And can I reiterate my thanks to Dr. Tedros and all of his colleagues at the WHO for all that they've been doing, not least in the last two years, but throughout your history. Uh, and also thank you to all the organizers for this very kind invitation to respond. As colleagues might know, uh, I, I focus myself on the interface between conservation and development. And I want to pick up a couple of themes from Dr. Tedros's remarks uh, particularly focusing on the importance of interdisciplinarity, of multi-sectoral cooperation, um, but also the need to remember to focus on the aspirations, the development needs of rural and marginalized communities as we think about future policies, both towards human health and planetary health. Um, so as Dr. Tedros very clearly remarked, uh, our human health is intimately linked with the health of the planet, with biodiversity, but also the health of human populations. Uh, we have a growing dependence on nature and that includes our direct dependence on ecosystems for goods and services, but also the contributions that nature makes to our sense of self and, and well-being. Um, and our connections with animals are deep and intimate, both domesticated and wild animals. And of course, as we think about the origins of the pandemic, those connections have been such an important part of trying to uh, associate the, the start of, of the pandemic that we're living through. Now, we know that zoonotic diseases take place and they jump to infect humans during spillover events. These spillover events can take place both from domesticated animals and from non-domesticated wild animals. Uh, 
And again, as Dr. Tedros has indicated, that something like 75% of infectious diseases are estimated to be of zoonotic origin. So how do we control some of those spillover uh, contexts? It's really important for us to think about those, those questions. Um, our dependence on animals, our dependence on nature is becoming more intense, not less. Uh, we, we are intensifying agricultural practices. We are intensifying farming. Um, and that brings humans and animals into ever closer contact. Um, that includes our uh, harvesting of wild animals and our harvesting of wild species. One of the responses that conservation organizations suggested immediately after the origins of the pandemic were first traced to a wild meat market, or was suggested that it might be associated with wildlife trade and consumption was to argue for an immediate ban on all forms of wildlife trade and consumption. The reason why that cause, causes me and colleagues who are working in this area some concern is that it doesn't necessarily, uh, firstly, understand the origins of some of those spillover events, which take place both within domesticated and non-domesticated non non wildlife settings, but also uh, it neglects the impacts of bans like this on human communities that are so dependent on wild sources of protein and nutrition. So a number of cultural practices and survival strategies of indigenous peoples of local communities depend on the availability of these wild sources. Uh, we need to understand the circumstances in which spillover takes place. And we need to have targeted interventions which prevent those spillover events without resulting in a blanket ban. Uh, the risk is that a blanket ban just pushes some of these practices underground, and we've seen this happen in many other places. So as Dr. Tedros has said, what we need is a better understanding of these spillovers. We need a one health approach, which is interdisciplinary, which is multisectoral, which seeks to understand this complex entanglement of pathogenic, human, animal, and environmental factors, which influence the emergence and spread of disease and then allow us to have more targeted responses so that our conservation strategies are more sensitive to the sustainable use practices that are essential to secure the livelihoods and development aspirations of rural communities. So I, I, I want to sort of just close with asking us to be a bit more sensitive to the unintended consequences of policies that might be designed to promote uh, a greater resilience towards the risks of zoonotic spillover. Thank, thank you. you very, very much, Professor Vera. And thank you especially for bringing in to an event which is understandably concerned about people, people's health, people who make the law, an important signal for all other species on this planet that we share it with. I'd like to thank all of our three respondents and turn directly to our guests who are here with us online. We have a group of very wonderful guests who have joined us tonight. And I would like to give an opportunity to some of them to ask questions to Dr. Tedros and also to our respondents, each of whom, of course, would be able to give a keynote in their own respect on these issues. So I'd like to turn in particular at the moment to Ms. Portia Garnon-Williams from the Youth Council on Law, Sci Science and Sustainability, to Dr. Marcus Gehring, Director of the Center for European Legal Studies and Fellow of the Lauterpach Center for International Law, as well as Dr. Antoinette Nestor, an Associate Fellow with the Center for International Sustainable Development Law, and of course, a postdoctoral fellow here in the University of Cambridge at Lucy Cavendish College, and Dr. Javier Romero Vidal from the Bennett Institute of Public Policy. I understand that you have questions for Dr. Tedros and for our respondents, and I'd like to ask perhaps Portia to go first. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Portia Garnons Williams, and I am a grade 12 student attending Ottawa Carleton Virtual Secondary School. I am a senior editor for the youth journal Harmony Youth Voices on Science, Law and Sustainability, a journal which was launched at the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference COP26. Our first public online publication was just last month and through research and volunteerism, I bring to light concerns about climate change and injustice against indigenous people. A crucial focus of SDG3 is to ensure access to public health for all people worldwide by 2030, including Indigenous people and youth. 
what are the main challenges to strengthen capacity in education so that we can ensure this goal becomes reality? How should higher education institutions and universities, including students around the world, best contribute? Thank you, Portia. Dr. Gehring, you had a question as well. We'll collect four and then we'll come back. Thank you very much for allowing me to, to intervene in this eventful uh, week where uh, yet again, the international rule of law is under severe strain. As director of the Center for European Legal Studies, I have a legally oriented question um, on the power of ideas. Um, it's also asked on behalf of my colleague, Jorge Vinuales. The concept of deep prevention, i.e. the prevention of pathogen spillover, as well as of disease outbreak, rather than just prevention of the spread of infectious diseases, has been increasingly discussed as a focus for a global pandemic treaty. There are several examples of the application of such an approach in the governance of environmental problems. Do you think, uh, what do you think would be the prospect of such an approach in the ongoing negotiations and how will the future global pandemic treaty align with the sustainable development goals? Thank you, and Dr. Antoinette Nestor. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And since um, International Women's Day is coming up in a few days, um, among the downstream effects of this pandemic, uh, we have seen the impact on the health and rights of women and girls around the world who continue to represent the vast majority of frontline health workers. And as the COVID-19 pandemic rages on, political leaders and religious leaders opposed to bodily autonomy continued to classify sexual and reproductive health services as non-essential. Now, the Global Sustainable Development Goals include targets specifically for women's health and for the quality of all in access in healthcare. In your view, Dr. Tedros, how concerned must we be where such services are relegated to non-essential stages? Thank you. Thank you. And I know we're piling you with really, really deep questions, but there's one last one that's based on a quite incredible study. Xavier? Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to ask this question. My name is Tamir Romero Vidal, and I'm a research associate at the Bennett Institute for Public Policy. And we published last month a report on the effects of the pandemic on public opinion around the globe. And we find that today, citizens support having experts making political decisions much more than they did before the pandemic. At the same time, however, we have also witnessed some distrust towards scientific evidence throughout the pandemic. So now that restrictions that emerged during the pandemic begin to be lifted, there is time to reflect on how scientific information has been communicated to the public as well as to uh, public health policymakers and leaders around the world. So where we expect pandemic preparedness to be enhanced, my question is, what has this experience taught you about how scientific evidence, especially medical knowledge, can be more effectively co-generated and communicated worldwide? Dr. Tedros, the floor is yours, and you can take the questions in whichever order you wish. Thank you, thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. I will uh, follow maybe the order the, with which the questions were asked. Um, on the first question, um, I will start from, uh, you know, the challenges we are facing now, especially uh, with achieving the universal health coverage. Uh, as you know, uh, there was a recent study, um, especially focused on the workforce, not only health, but beyond. Uh, but the report on the health workforce was very, very concerning. Uh, I know you know about the word that was coined. I don't remember the person who coined it, but um, the great resignation. Uh, many uh, health workers are leaving, especially last November 2021. Uh, what was seen globally was the biggest, actually, 
um, or the greatest resignation. Many people have left their jobs. This is because of stress. This is because of, um, uh, you know, all that they have faced during, during the pandemic. Uh, and if we're going to achieve universal health coverage, I don't think we can do it without the workforce that's needed. Uh, that's central. I mean, talent is, is central and workforce is, is, is central. So, um, I mean, this question is very, very important. I think we need to come together as global community uh, and improve, increase the involvement of um, uh, the academia, um, not only to train the gap that we had, uh, from before that was carried on, uh, but also uh, the gap that we will be uh, facing because of this great resignation. Uh, so if I bring one factor now as a threat to the achievement of the SDGs is the workforce. And I think the engagement of the academic institutions will be very, very important. As you know, WHO has more than 800 collaborating centers, academic institutions. Uh, through them and with them, I think, and expanding our reach, uh, mobilizing um, the academia globally and finding a solution to address this gap will be uh, very important. Of course, uh, traditionally, we haven't gone beyond the 800 collaborating centers uh, but we believe that we need uh, to go beyond and address uh, the uh, human, uh, the health workforce crisis that we have been facing, we're facing, and in the future, it could even be more serious. Uh, so this is a very important issue, and I hope uh, the University of Cambridge will take it seriously. But from WHO side, one of the advantages we have is convening we would be happy to convene global conference uh, to address uh, this issue and then uh, hopefully address the problem and um, uh, achieve the um, uh, UHC, the, I mean the um, uh, SDG goals of 2030. Then the second question on deep uh, uh, prevention, I fully agree. Um, it's, it's better to stop pathogens from jumping from animals to humans. That's, that can help us to even prevent outbreaks from happening. Uh, so that's very central, by the way. And as you know, illegal wildlife um, trade is contributing to this. Uh, but as uh, Professor... Uh, um, Vera said, uh, not only wild, but even from, it could be from domesticated. Uh, so uh, having in the provision of the treaty, uh, at least addressing the deep prevention or provisions that address the deep prevention will be very, very important. As you know, we have a trilateral partnership between the uh, OIE, the Animal Health uh, um, Organization, and also FAO uh, as part of the One Health Partnership that we, we, we have. Uh, and considering this, uh, deep prevention will be important actually. On the IB and the negotiation of the treaty, by the way, thank you so much to Dame Barbara for outlining the three principles, solidarity, accountability, and equity. The INB is expected to have fora uh, organize uh, platforms to engage civil society, academic institutions, uh, and um, uh, other uh, private sector and other stakeholders. Uh, I would suggest that you really use the platform to push these ideas because the INB is expected to uh, um, uh, involve um, or to engage as many stakeholders as, as, as possible. So coming from you, justifying why it should be included will be very important. From WHO side, we will also do our part from the Secretariat because we believe in deep prevention. That's where we should tackle it, actually. That's where you can prevent 
outbreaks even from happening, not even pandemics. If you can prevent the jumping of pathogens from animals to, to the humans. So we agree with the idea, with the proposal. We will work from our side, but please uh, engage from your side as well, because they will, they will engage the academy and other institutions in finding ideas to be included in the treaty. On SRHR, WHO and me personally, I believe in sexual reproductive health and rights. Um, when I was working as uh, Minister of Health, uh, I understand how difficult it is actually, especially um, uh, at, at, at country uh, level. Uh, and I had some experience at country level and tried to use that, apply that in, in, in WHO, and our investment has actually expanded significantly during the last uh, four years. The sexual and reproductive health and rights is very important, not only for women, by the way, it's for the whole society. And we're trying to help member states understand, understand that. But many of the guidance we have including the guidance we have as part of the sexual and reproductive health and rights, the abortion. Many countries do not want to, to use that because they say they have uh, national bills that uh, would not uh, allow it. Of course, uh, we encourage them to use as much as they can from the sexual and reproductive health rights uh, guidance that we have. But I'm glad also to share with you that majority of countries actually use it. And if there are countries who have extreme laws that prevent it are around 20. So we have an account of who these countries are and what we can do at least to work with them on the minimum engagement they want. Because as you know, we cannot... Um, uh, impose anything on, uh, especially when there are national uh, laws, uh, but we can only present why, uh, in terms of science and public health, uh, the guidance we give, especially on sexual and reproductive health, actually helps uh, the country. So we will continue to push. It should not be treated as non-essential. It's very important for the woman. It's very important for the society or for, for, for the country. Glad that many countries are buying in, but we have to continue to um, sell uh, the idea uh, because it, in terms of science and public health, it's, it's very important. But with the legal issues, hopefully, um, you know, countries will uh, open up, but we have seen many countries opening up. Um, then, uh, so, um, although it's the number of countries we have now problem with are limited still, I would say to your specific question, question that we're really concerned that some of these countries are not uh, taking SRHR as an, as an essential service. Then the last question um, on information, I think... Um, there is misinformation, there is disinformation. The most fatal is, by the way, the disinformation. It may, I don't know how we can categorize it in one of the two, uh, but there is also another uh, element where uh, we have challenges is when political leaders undermine signs for their own political reasons. That's actually we have found to be very, very uh, difficult. Uh, so from WHO side, of course, we have been from the start very clear about communication. One, the global communication that WHO is, has been doing and is still doing. We started, by the way, from daily briefing. And then now we do once a week. And we have also encouraged countries to do national briefings and especially when political leaders um, enhance or support and brief their community um, regularly, we have seen uh, the trust that is created between the leadership or the, the, the government and, um, and the um, and communities or society or citizens. 
So we have been encouraging, we have been doing it ourselves, but we have been encouraging countries to do national briefings, but based on science in support, especially political leaders, in support of science and, and evidence. Uh, so in order to fight misinformation and disinformation, the global um, the platforms are important, like what WHO is doing, but more important are the national uh, or the local or national uh, platforms to inform uh, citizens and give the right uh, information. And of course, the third is what we're doing with the tech industries, because the social media has been very central, especially in disseminating uh, wrong information, of course, not disseminating directly, but uh, the content that's shared by anti-vaxxers and so on has been very, very uh, difficult. And we have some experience now on partnering with the tech industry to fight misinformation and disinformation. So the lessons we have uh, learned, of course, should be compiled uh, uh, properly. We are still learning, uh, but uh, you know the, the communication of scientific information is one of the important areas, but which has also been very much, uh, you know, challenged throughout the pandemic uh, because of misinformation, disinformation, but because of political political um, manipulation or politicization uh, of um, science itself that we have seen in 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 some in some countries. Uh, so th I think these are the um, questions raised, and uh, thank you so much uh, for this. I think we ha we ha we have uh, time constraint. I wish I could be with you, but if there are maybe additional last questions you would like, I I would be happy to stay uh, a bit more. Oh, that would be incredible. We do actually have a few other questions that are are with us, and I will run through them quickly, but we will all stay online as well for an additional um, 20 or 30 minutes to allow us to, um, uh, to, to, to come back to um, our respondents as well. So what I'll do is I will ask directly if we have just a few more questions for Dr. Tedros. And in particular, I understand that Dr. Jessica Campos is online, um, a fellow of Synergy, Ms. Jin Quinn, a PhD student from the Department of Land Economy is online as well. Ms. Lauren Milden, a policy advisor from the Sen Cambridge um, uh, Center for Science and Policy and Dr. John Barker, the director of the Cambridge Governance Labs. You are also online and I know you had questions for Dr. Tedros. So since he's kindly granted us a few extra minutes of his time, I'd like to ask each of you to ask just a short version of your question and we'll come back to him and then to the respondents if he has to slip away. Um, with, with one, one minor um, uh, extra question for our Vice Chancellor that we don't want to lose. So please go ahead, uh, Jessica Ocampos. Uh, thank you so much. I am Dr. Jessica Ocampos, Fellow of the Cambridge Centre of Environment, Energy and Natural Resources Governance, and also an advisor in Innovation and Technology Transfer. Uh, in the University of Cambridge. My question is um, related to well, technology and technology transfer, of course. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic showed us the importance of local innovation capability. And on the 18th of February this year, the WHO announced the first six countries in Africa that will receive support to the manufacture mRNA vaccines at scale, which actually was mentioned during this, uh, this the lecture. The manufacturing process, however, is in the, in the downstream of the innovation pipeline. So how is the WHO planning to support the rest of the innovation chain, especially the earlier stages such as R&D in these and other countries? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Jean Queen, Jane? Thank you very much. It's a great honor. Pleasure for me to be here. Um, I'm Jen Quinn, a PhD student in land economy at the University of Cambridge. And I'm currently working on the international environmental law. So my question is about the possibility and the difficulties of having a consolidated international legal instrument on global health. Um, so the 7th of April, 
as the next World Health Day, I think is a timely reminder that a stronger international health instrument is needed. This seems to be um, especially urgent during and after this pandemic as a treaty, a convention and agreement or in other legal formats. The Global Public Health Convention is definitely um, a hurray in this regard. So to Dan Barbara talking, um, comparing to the current, especially among governance, what aspects do you think should be strengthened mostly and what are the possible tough challenges? Thank you very much. And two last very quick questions, Lauren. Many thanks to Dr. Tedros and the panel. In recent years, we have seen a growing trend of private foundations and donors contributing to the WHO alongside member states. What are the benefits that you see emerging from working with a broader set of stakeholders from civil society? And how can civil society further engage with the work of the WHO? And Dr. John Barker? You're muted. There we go. I'm John Barker, director of the Lauderpack Center, uh, Cambridge Governance Labs uh, and fellow of the Lauderpack Center here in Cambridge. The question about tools to address relevant human and social dynamics, including problems of dis disinformation that were mentioned. Having observed on a global scale, various competing forces that influence public health policies and compliance, such as trust in public institutions, national, political, and economic calculations, and cultural factors, as well as evolving science. Is the WHO developing any new strategies to track and perhaps influence these forces to ensure that national policies do not become excessively untethered from science? Thank you. Thank you very much. Four very challenging questions for you, Dr. Tedros. You can give as many answers as you have time for. And then if you have to slip away, we have some respondents who are very kindly going to make their expertise available as well. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I would have actually loved if uh, others could also <laughs> Uh, address the issues. Um, I will try and then pass it over as soon as soon as possible, so I can listen to others. On um, technology transfer, the support we're giving uh, to the mRNA technology hub we have in South Africa is one is mobilizing finance because they will need money to uh, develop the product that they're developing. Um, so we have mobilized many donors, actually, Germany, France, Belgium, the European Union, and so on, have already supported. And the second part is technical assistance. Uh, and as you know, WHO has the opportunity or the advantage of convening. So we have mobilized experts uh, who have know-how in mRNA technology uh, so that, you know, they can transfer uh, knowledge uh, to the institutions in South Africa. So Afrigen has already benefited from, from that. So I think these are the two areas we're, we're supporting them with, and both are important for uh, research and development. And at the same time, our uh, chief scientist and the science division in WHO is coordinating the support that the uh, research and, I mean, the type of research and development support Afrigen gets I hope you know Afrigen, and we will also support Biovac. And then Stoll, Stoll and Bosch uh, University is also involved, and uh, uh, we're, we're helping the whole uh, ecosystem. Uh, then on um, the legal instrument, uh, especially the, um, the, the treaty, uh, the focus areas, it, it, it actually aligns with the problems we are facing. Um, some of the challenges we are facing is sharing information or sharing data. And the other is sharing pathogen, pathogens or biological materials. Um, and sharing 
uh, tools, the technology, once you have tools to fight the pandemic. Uh, I think uh, then Barbara's talking had already outlined this could be categorized in solidarity, accountability, and, and equity issues uh, as well. Um, so we, we believe that the binding agreement will address these questions. Uh, of course, these are not the only ones and it's not exhaustive, uh, but we, we, we have seen through this pandemic, the, especially the sharing part has been very uh, difficult, starting from sharing information, pathogens and um, uh, the tools uh, or uh, uh, products. Uh, from our side also, we're trying while waiting for the treaty, uh, we're um, trying to do our share by establishing some institutions that can help in facilitating, for instance, sharing of pathogens. Um, we have a biohub now, a new biohub in Switzerland, which we newly established uh, that can facilitate. And once we have the bill or the binding, the legally binding agreement, these institutions could be empowered uh, to, do, uh, to do their job. But until the treaty is agreed, um, uh, we don't want to wait. So uh, they will be operating based on a voluntary basis. And some countries have already volunteered to share, uh, pathogen, to share pathogens or biological materials with this hub uh, so we can use it for research and uh, development. Then on uh, foundation, uh, the, we, one of the challenges we, we, we have in WHO is WHO is shy by design. So in terms of partnership, we were not really proactively uh, engaging. Uh, we have not been proactively engaging partners, especially civil society. Um, so we saw weaknesses in that, so we are strengthening it. And if I give you one example, uh, we have a very vibrant civil society helping us with TB, uh, and they're involved even in uh, preparing or developing the guidance we, we prepare for uh, tuberculosis uh, treatment and, 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 and management. Uh, and I can give you examples with other programs also that we have now very strong partnership with uh, the civil society. But not only limited to civil society, we're also working with the private sector. Uh, for instance, with the food industry, uh, we have agreed to eliminate trans fat, industrial trans fat by 2023. And they have already committed to doing that. And many uh, mega industries, food industries uh, uh, are actually moving uh, forward. And they tell us, of course, we need to check. We need some independent verification. <laughs> But they tell us that they have already achieved the elimination target, and they don't use uh, industrial trans fat in their in in the food they uh, they they produce. So the, the private sector and the third is what we have said already er, earlier said with the academia. I think WHO has that convening responsibility. It's a platform, and uh, engaging the, the civil society, engaging the private sector, engaging the academia, will help us to achieve the SDG goals. And I don't want to go into details, but the engagement of all these actors is um, being strengthened. But we also understand that we do, we need, we need to do more. Uh, one of the focus areas for today is the treaty. I think the engagement, involvement of civil society, especially in shaping the outcome of the binding agreement and treaty will be very, very important. And we would like to work with you actually to identify some civil society who can be involved, starting from the panel led by uh, Dame uh, Barbara uh, to help us in shaping the binding agreement, because this will be a generational agreement. This is serious. And uh, I think we have to give it our best and it should be through mobilizing the whole society. Um, uh, so these are the, um, uh, then on um, the national policy to be informed by science, that's going to be a tough, a tough issue because uh, during this uh, pandemic, what we have seen is, especially at national level, we were calling for unity and for um, even political parties 
you know, to work together to fight uh, this pandemic. But in many countries, uh, the contrary was happening, you know, using politicizing things and undermining uh, science and evidence. It will not be an easy uh, task, actually, to understand uh, what has been happening uh, in this area and, uh, you know, uh, develop a sort of guideline to influence national uh, policy. It's very difficult to say that I, uh, you know, I can say now uh, this is how we should do it or this is what we should we should do. Uh, but we have uh, a new uh, science division, which is a product of the transformation. And we have already some experience in, in many countries. There are countries who have done it really well and countries who haven't. I think uh, documenting the experience of the countries who have done it really well in terms of informing their national policy from science and evidence, if we can document this properly, it could be a lesson for, for, for the whole uh, world. So that's what we're, we're thinking. I, I believe the solution is already in some of the countries who have done it really the right, the right way. And it will be a matter of documenting that and uh, having lessons uh, from there uh, globally. So uh, thank you so much. These are very important issues, but uh, would be happy also to listen to um, the, uh, uh, you know, your faculty who are here, um, overwhelmed actually by the uh, presence of senior faculty and uh, all uh, members of the um, University of Cambridge uh, and look forward also to hear their uh, uh, idea and opinion on, on, on the issues raised. Thank you so much. And back to you, uh, Professor Segal. Thank you very much. And thank you especially for these comprehensive answers. We do indeed have respondents with us who I think are going to be very interested in certain ones of this initial round of two rounds, really, of eight questions. So I'm going to turn back to our respondents and ask you to just give a couple of brief answers to one or two questions each. And then we're going to start taking some of the questions online from our, our Zoom audience through our Zoom moderator students. Please go ahead, um, maybe Dame Barbara Stocking first and then Professor Sharon Peacock and then Professor Bhaskar Vera. Thank you. Um, I'll come to the pandemic, the treaty ones first, because that's obviously where I'm working. And uh, but maybe one extra on women. Um, the issues about deep prevention are very, very significant, of course, absolutely. And um, my panel is pushing for a framework convention. And I think that fits very well with what needs to happen with the deep prevention part in that a lot of work needs to be done now to find out what exactly you would put in a treaty on this. As, as Basker has said, you've got to be very careful what you're actually asking for first. But if you have a framework convention, then you can have a number of protocols and they don't all have to be done immediately this year. They can be phased out as uh, to be part of the treaty still, but coming in at a later time when we're really ready for them. So that's one point on the, on the deep um, prevention. Um, I think uh, the other point uh, that Jane was asking about is important about the tough challenges. I think I've said something about that, but I, I, what I'd say is some things in all this are easier for countries to agree to. And that's probably preparedness of providing you have the money to do it. What's more difficult is actually uh, being persuaded by the WHO guidance that that is the right thing to do for your country. And for reasons I've said, that's already quite a tough issue. For people but it's particularly difficult in different cultures who can bring off different things whether it's mask wearing or whatever it is so um, I think there's an issue about what is absolute and we must have it done and what is it that, that is going to have to be left to some negotiation with within countries and within regions particularly about what is appropriate for them um, so that's a, a couple of the points the last one on the treaty is Yes, we really need the whole of society backing this treaty. And this is really problematic. Um, the, uh, the public can pretty well understand, I think, this, the issues about vaccines, that this really is not fair. For most of the issues on public health, uh, that is well beyond them. They understand an awful lot more now, but even so, trying to get, in, get public excited by the idea of a treaty on public health issues is quite difficult, actually. So I think we really do need the engagement of civil society. 
Um, obviously, the People's Vaccine Group, which is one of the biggest uh, civil society groups, is doing very well on pressing on the, the whole equity side. But we need to get them and others involved with us if we can to try and it's, it's again, it's like putting across the message to the public that they really need this treaty as well. So really big challenge there. Last one on uh, women. I just wanted to broaden this out just a little bit as to uh, COVID-19 and women's rights and roles, actually. Um, one of the most obvious, of course, is about violence against women, which has taken a serious toll during this time. But I also want to talk just a moment about the whole issue about work, because in some ways COVID-19 has been positive for women, i.e. you don't have to be present in the, in the office every day, all day. You can actually still be trusted to work in other times, which may suit both men and women who have caring responsibilities. But we've got very good knowledge now that actually women are losing jobs and not going back to them. And also that while this um, ability to work at home is one thing, it is making it much harder for them uh, in, that, in, in that they are doing an overwhelmingly more amount of childcare than men are. So all those things that we have fought for for so long, uh, we have to watch out very carefully to make sure that although, you know, in some ways COVID has helped us in terms of work, in other ways, it's been a real drawback for women, sadly. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon, over to you. I think you have other questions that you'd also be able to come in on. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I'd like to touch on a couple of points, really. One is uh, uh, a response to Jessica, who was asking about um, training the vaccine pipeline at the very beginning of research and development. And, and I think that that's, that's in particular in reference to, to Africa. Now, I think that's a very important point, but the point I think I'd like to make is that we need to train scientists to deal with not only the current threat, but actually we need the next generation of scientists to be ready for new threats. And the difficulty there is that the breakthroughs we'll need can't be best guessed at the moment. We don't know what sort of technologies we'll need to tackle the next, the next challenge. And I think mRNA vaccines are really a case in point in that they didn't exist until the pandemic came along and then the technology was developed. So I would suggest really that training the next generation of scientists in Africa and elsewhere is vital, but it needs to extend well beyond the remit of vaccine development. And the responsibility for that goes far beyond the WHO and rests with universities and scientific institutions worldwide, as well as research funders and donors. I think I'd also like to touch on uh, Xavier's point around communication. We heard, we heard from Dr. Tedros about the, the excellent work they've done in terms of, of uh, the, uh, the information and communication that they've done uh, really repeatedly and regularly since the start of the pandemic. And I have to say that I've really thanked them for their work on naming variants of concern. Uh, the, the system was very confusing prior to that. And that really helped me with my work and helped to reduce stigma from people uh, for countries where uh, variants arose first. But I'd also like to, to draw out the fact that actually communication is really vital within communities where co-production is also vital. So we need to have information that's being given to others by people that, that you trust. And the format of the information needs to be adapted to be meaningful to our lives. So a simple messages such as with masks, I protect you and you protect me. And I think that that community level information is really essential if interventions such as vaccine surge testing, virus control measure, measures are really going to be uh, effective. So I thought I'd add that to the communication piece. Thanks very much. It's a really, really important point. And, and uh, Javier, you and Sharon are going to need to talk. Um, Bhaskar, over to you. Thank you, um, and thanks to my colleagues for their responses as well. I, I thought I might pick up on Porsche's um, early question around the role of higher education and the role of institutions like ours in this in this context. And um, I, I think um, you know Sharon has already mentioned the importance of training the next generation of scientists in the broadest sense, and I think the importance of that depth to enable them to be responsive to the next set of challenges, which will look different to what we've experienced in the past. People need to be creative and adaptive in the way in which they can respond. But I think the other um, element of that picks up on the One Health um, approach that Dr. Tedros and others have been talking about, which is around interdisciplinarity and the importance of interdisciplinary training 
uh, within institutions like ours. I think the, the emphasis on bringing those forms of opportunities for the next generation of students who come through uh, so that they can learn from each other, so that they can uh, think beyond individual sectoral responses and look at these integrated solutions is really important. So I think the challenge to us is to embrace interdisciplinarity in all forms of teaching and research, which we are doing, but I think we need to continue to do more of. Um, I did want to pick up on the communication point and link it. I think Marcus asked the question about prevention of, of spillover as well. And I think the um, Sharon entered with this uh, trusted communicator point. And I think it's important even in the context of the things that I was touching upon in my intervention. Um, what we've, we've done a sort of review of some of these uh, zoonotic spillover events. And I think it's really important to understand the circumstances in which spillover takes place, the way in which people prepare meat, the way in which they butcher meat, the way in which they consume it, um, is actually a very important ingredient of trying to understand the risks as well as the prevention strategies. And I think hearing that from peers, from trusted elders, from people who have been practicing these uh, forms of consumption for, for a long time is a very important part of the communication so that we prevent the risk of the actual spillover at its source. Um, and I think the importance of communication that Xavier has been talking about, I think is, 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 is really critical in that context as well. So just a couple of quick responses. I know there are other things we could all pick up on, but I don't want to uh, dominate the discussion yet. Thank you. And those are extremely good points. I'm going to turn to our students who are waiting patiently online. And I'd like to ask you if you have a final closing round of maybe four more questions that have come forward through the Zoom chat that you would like to communicate to Dr. Tedros. And then we are going to finish only 10 minutes later than we'd originally planned. Um, yes, thank you, Mary Claire. Um, I have the first question, which comes from Sophia Hesketh, a Cambridge graduate and former Gavi Alliance and COVAX employee, along with John Wibberley from the UK. Um, their question asks about how we can balance the need for innovative but energy consuming medical solutions like ultra cold storage for new vaccines with the urgent need to meet ongoing global commitments to sustainability. They also ask what progress might be made through integrating conservation, agricultural and human health policies for mutual benefit. Excellent. Do we have two other questions as well from Neville? Yes, so I have a question from Sophie Chappell, a student at the University of Birmingham in the United Kingdom. How has the COVID-19 pandemic shone light on human ethics and morality? What do you think we have learned about ourselves as we watch the government innovate new measures and make our own personal decisions about health, vaccinations and isolation? Excellent. And Tejas, do you have two more? Yes. So we have a question from uh... Paulina Perez Duarte from Mexico, as well as Hongao Leng from China. Uh, they ask, positive public health outcomes can be stifled by factors such as nationalism, extreme wealth and inequality, and recent conflict. How can we develop strategies to support vulnerable populations across countries around the world, regardless of income types, such as children and refugees? Dr. Tedros, any of those that you would like to hear, and you can also turn to your respondents, and I know they will answer before we have to close definitely at, at, at 640. And I will again invite our respondents, all of whom are very much experts, as well as our VIP guests who are here online, including Professor Eyal Benvenisti from the Lauderpak Center, as well as, of course, Professor Diane Coyle, who is from the uh, Bennett Institute, and um, here online as well, Dr. Mark Cotter, who founded BitBio, um, a biomedical firm here in Cambridge. If they would like to type any answers into the um, chat for some of the others who have asked questions online, because we can also answer that way. So over to you, Dr. Tedros, for any that you would wish to take from among that round. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I would prefer if they could, uh, there is, you know, the professors could start and then maybe if there is anything I can add, I would. Uh, Wonderful. We will do that. Yeah, I'm you. going to go backward this time and ask if Bhaskar and then Sharon and then Barbara. Um, They're I, tough I, questions. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll pick up on the first uh, set of questions which Charlotte read out, which are really trying to think about this integrated approach uh, across conservation, health and human development strategies and the real importance of trying to bring those together. 
Um, I just want to agree with the sentiment behind the question. I mean, it's it's critically important that we understand both the synergies between those initiatives, but also to recognize that initiatives in one area can have unexpected inadvertent consequences for others. So there are trade-offs as well. And I think we need to be mindful of those when we're, when we're looking at future policies. So that's just one very quick response to one of the questions. Thank you. And Professor Peacock? Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to pick up on uh, how the pandemic has really shone a light on ethics and morality, actually, and what's happened to, to our world. Uh, and, and going back to the, um, the lack of equity over vaccines that we were talking about, it's, it's, it's a very difficult situation that it's so unfair. And so we haven't done as well as we could have done this time round, but uh, you know, as we go forward uh, together, with concerted improved governance, I very much hope that we can shine a light on those issues and actually create plans that do better for our kind of global community in, in the future. Um, and I think the same is true. It really links to the question about public health outcomes and vulnerable populations. This is really considering the people that need the help most and creating plans that actually put them at the front of the queue rather than at the back of the queue. Thank you. Absolutely. And Dame Barbara Stocking. Yes, just picking up again the, the human ethics or what we've learned. I think one of the things we've learned is to remind ourselves about how important community is. Um, you know, in our sort of helter skelter world, we often forget about that. And yet it is, you know, good communities have really helped everywhere. And it's important too in that, in the sense of um, what we can do to handle pandemics. There's been a recent study in The Lancet that showed that beyond the age of populations, the key determinants of death were two. One was how much you trusted your government in that country um, by other measures, by particular good measures. The second one is the issue about collective trust. How much did you actually believe that other people would, would, would go along with what you were doing as well, what was being asked for? And those two made the real difference in the number of deaths, which is, I think, absolutely fascinating. And understanding that, that point about we are um, in societies, we are in collective groups, and that matters. It matters to us in how we feel and how we, you know, how we survive total lockdown, really. But also it matters in terms of how we actually deliver the outcome of being able to control a pandemic. Absolutely. And Dr. Tedros, would you like to add anything? There are some incredible additional questions popping up in the chat, but yeah. I know that we're tight of time. No, thank you. So um, I think the first one um, on ultra cold chain, um, you know, many countries are not able to use the mRNA vaccines because of uh, weak uh, cold chain systems. Um, and one of the uh, things the mRNA hub in South Africa is exploring is uh, to, um, uh, you know, find a new product that could, that may not, that does not need uh, ultra cold chain. Um, so it can be used, um, you know, any in any setting or environment. And that, I think, could protect our environment at the same time. Uh, so maybe more investment in, um, uh, you know, in uh, products that are stable even in room temperature would actually help. <laughs> of course, normal refrigeration could be, uh, you know, there is capacity on normal refrigeration. Uh, but uh, we need to find technologies that uh, can help us uh, in, um, you know, that do not need uh, ultra cold chain. Uh, then on uh, ethics, there was a study on morality. There was a study in some countries uh, where public opinion was actually in support of sharing vaccines. This was in... Uh, uh, early February, in February, March last year. Um, and uh, however, although the public opinion in many high income countries was pro sharing, more than 80% approving sharing, while the governments were doing the contrary. Although we were pushing governments to share because it's in the interest of each and every country on, in, 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 in the world. 
So my wish is if uh, leaders could listen to their uh, citizens, I think that the citizens had the, the right answer in, in those surveys. Um, so um, that's probably what I would like, I would like uh, to add. Um, otherwise, the world, I mean, this pandemic would have been handled differently and in a better way. If, if there was um, morality and ethical considerations to many of the things we have been uh, doing. I think these are the um, uh, issues. But one thing on nationalism, uh, nationalism will always be there. The issue is how can we avoid narrow nationalism? Um, so, uh, if, if it's not narrow nationalism, I think it can accommodate uh, sharing. So it's the extreme uh, part of it which, which is causing a problem. Otherwise, nationalism, I think, will, will continue be, to be the case, but it should not be a very narrow nationalism that was actually preventing um, the world from uh, tackling the pandemic in, in unison. Thank, thank you. you, and back to you. Thank you very, very much. I'm going to thank all of our respondents, all of our guests who have joined us online, over 500 of our online listeners who were also with us tonight, as well as those listening on the YouTube of Cambridge and also the live stream of the WHO, and especially, of course, our lecturer, Dr. Tedros. But to give you a proper Cambridge Thank you. I'm going to hand back to our vice chancellor, whose lecture series, of course, we are all enjoying. Professor Stephen Toop. Thanks so much, Mary Claire. And uh, I must say, Dr. Tedros, you've been extraordinarily uh, generous with your time. Your team warned us that you might have to leave a little bit early, and the fact that you haven't is uh, really very much appreciated, though your staff may now be very angry with us. I hope not. Uh, but really heartfelt words of thanks uh, for uh, such a, a wide-ranging and I think challenging lecture. Uh, it was really important that you picked out those five areas where real progress happened has to be made. Uh, I also want to take a final opportunity to thank you and the whole WHO team for all of the hard, hard work that you have been undertaking to advance human health, not just during the pandemic, but far beyond that. Uh, thanks again to our audience uh, watching the broadcast in Cambridge and around the world. And thank you very much to our respondents, to various institutions across the university who've been collaborating to make this happen. It seems to me that the university and one like Cambridge is just the perfect space for the sort of challenging evidence-based discussions that we've been having today. The exchanges that are at the heart of what we do in both education and research. I hope that tonight's event will have been a valuable opportunity to inform students, researchers, and decision makers, past, present, future, all of whom have uh, to face significant global challenges. So thank you for joining us. Thank you again, Dr. Tedros. Best wishes. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Toop, for your closing remarks and for all your vision with this Vice Chancellor's lecture series on globalization, sustainability, and the power of ideas. Our thanks also to Dr. Tedros and the World Health Organization for their work throughout the past years and to all the partner and host institutions within the University of Cambridge. Thank you to the audience for joining us online today. This event is now closed.